Thank you, David, and um, greetings, everyone. So uh, I think those that are regulars uh, know that we are in a journey of Ephesians this year, and last week we finished chapter one. And so this week, uh, normally we'd be starting chapter two. And um, But I also thought that uh, in light of this next Thursday being Valentine's Day, and I, I think you, you, most of you have gotten the message, we're not going to be together on this uh, uh, online fellowship next Thursday so that people can be with the, they can love the ones that they're with. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that. But one of the big things that comes up in chapter two actually is the great love of God wherewith he loved us. And so although we'll pick that back up and we'll pick up in chapter two, uh, not next week, but the following week, I thought tonight we would focus uh, on on love in Ephesians. And uh, as kind of a, a prelude to Valentine's next week. And so by the way, as a, as a first thought, thinking about what to call this, uh, originally I was thinking about, well, how about love in Ephesians? Does love come up in Ephesians? Um, some of you know that, uh, that the Greek, see if Shane Hyatt was on, he, he'd probably love this, but I think many of us know that in Greek, uh, all the letters are together. Right, there is no um, punctuation between words and all that kind of thing. So, in translation work, like John does and Jerry does, you have to sort out what's the word, and then you have to sort out where do the phrases and the word come together. So, in light of that, if if we were doing this in English, so just thinking about this, so I originally wrote down, well, how about love in Ephesians? The or what if it was loving Ephesians, like McDonald's? I'm loving it. So it could be titled Loving Ephesians, depending on how we punctuate it. So I thought, okay, well, then we can also trade phrases because translation of phrases. So it could be Ephesians in love, although that kind of sounds like Ephesians in love with other Ephesians or something. Um, or it could be an Ephesians love in. So there would then we get. I bet we could get Gary Bolin back in his seventies playing music if we think about love in. So I finally settled on experiencing Ephesians in love. That's really what tonight's sharing is about. Because the year is about experiencing Ephesians what I would hope we'd focus on tonight, the message of tonight, is to experience Ephesians in love. Do you know that the word love is used in the REV, anyway, about 24 times in the book of Ephesians? So what I would suggest there is that outside of maybe the words God or the word Jesus Christ, or prepositional phrases, I would suggest I don't know that there's any concept like a word like love used any more times than 24 in the book of Ephesians. Now, there's probably someone like Dennis or Rob Woods who probably can check that somewhere in Bible works. I don't know, I'm not at that pay grade, but I would, I would press to find another concept that comes up as much as love in Ephesians. So when we talk about experiencing Ephesians in love, this is a significant focus in the book of Ephesians. And what I would hope is that we would walk away tonight recognizing a little bit bigger the, the relationship, the loving relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father, that we have with our Lord and Savior, but even more, not more importantly, but as importantly, that how we experience much of that love is by the relationships that we have one with another. That's where the experience comes in of knowing much of God's love and our Lord and Savior's love. We experience it because of the relations that we have one with another. 
So one, one other sort of uh, uh, thing to frame this, and then we're just going to look, we're going to walk through Ephesians together, this, this walking in love, is um, I think many of us are familiar, familiar with the Greek word that's used 24 times is either the noun uh, agape or the verb uh, agapeo, which I think mo many of us are very familiar with. I think some of us that have that go way back in ministry days have a definition of agape. It's like, you know, the love of God and Christ and the renewed mind, that kind of thing. What I'd like to suggest that we do is expand that, to just expand so that when we consider love and agape, not that there's anything wrong with the other, but I'd like for us to think about it, maybe expand our thinking. So. So here's some ways, um, these, these are some of the different uh, ways to think about this word it, using the English language. So here's one, and these are some different people. These are the guys that John and Jerry and others study when they do their work. So here's Freiburg. Here's one of the commentaries on Freiburg. And Freiburg says, so here's, here's the noun of love. Love, especially as an attitude of appreciation resulting from a conscious evaluation and choice. And it's used of divine and human love. It's devotion. So, so an attitude of appreciation resulting from conscious evaluation and choice. Someone chooses and, and appreciates base of, because they choose to, because of evaluation. Okay, here's another one. Love is the quality of warm regard for and interest in one another. It's esteem or affection or regard or love. This is BDAG. One of those is of human love. In other words, of regard and esteem for one another. And actually, we're going to see that a lot in Ephesians. Another is of the love of God and Christ. Here's another one. Uh, this is Danker. Danker says, love a relatively high level of interest in the well-being of another. I love that. I mean, isn't that what we just spent 40 minutes on tonight is, is gathering and fellowshipping and bearing in and praying for and sharing because we're interested in the well-being of one another. Again, it's affection or esteem. Um, now, love the verb, because I think the verb maybe even resonates a little bit better, because we think of love on the verb side of a doing and action thing. So here it is. It's a nuance of, of the verb. So here we go with love. Love, especially of love based on evaluation and choice, a matter of will and action. Love is it's a matter of we decide to love. It's will, it's action, it's choice that we make to love. And love can be towards persons. In other words, we can be love or be lo love or be loyal to or highly regard each other. We can have that love toward God, or we can have that love from God. We'll see all of those in Ephesians. Here's another, and by the way, that was Freiburg. Again, I think that was Freiburg. So here's B Day. Love is to have a warm regard for and interest in another, to cherish or have affection for or love. And again, that can be by human beings, can have that kind of love. Those we can have that love for each other. Or, and it can be of the love of uh, B Day would call it transcendent beings. In other words, God, Jesus Christ things like that. Here's another one. Here's Gingrich. To love or have affection for of persons, of God, of Jesus, and people. And one last one. Love of personal relationships have such an interest in another that one wishes to contribute to the other's well-being. So let me say this one more time. Personal relationships have such an interest in another that one wishes to contribute to the other's well-being, have concern for or to hold in esteem. So it's 
It's, for instance, of God's affection for people or humanity, um, of Jesus' affection or regard for people, especially the church, and as modeled as a model for husbands, as we'll see in Ephesians. So, okay. So, um, all right, so, so does that give us a feel, at least, a, this, this is the topic. What we're looking at is, here in the book of Ephesians, 24 times God teased this up. In each section of Ephesians, there's something there that's related to this. It's in every chapter of Ephesians. So let's begin in chapter 1, and in verse 4, which is the first time that it's used here in Ephesians, so we know uh, those that have been on, on the fellowships of late know that, that this first uh, love is right in the very first section, and it's all about, it's one long sentence about God's purpose of the ages, his plan for the ages, and he teased this right up by saying in verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish in his presence in what? Love. That's the word. That's our first time. So, so where are we? So the starting point, so the starting point of God's purpose of the ages is that he chose us to be in union with Christ, in relationship with Christ. We looked at that a lot. Before the foundation of the world, and what his desire was is that we would be holy and without blemish, and John talked about that a few weeks ago, about being acceptable in his presence, then in love, that we would be holy and acceptable in his presence in love. Our holiness and our, um, our, accept our, our blameless, all of this, they're, they're intimately connected with love. This is to be, this is to be the foundation point that we would be holy, we would be acceptable in love. That's, that's the starting point um, from the beginning. So this word, and I, I mentioned it, but I'll just say it again here. This word in Ephesians is actually often used of, of human love. Um, so let me just, here, I'm going to look at a, at a little thing here. So, so this is, so this is the word agape, this word agape, it's often used of human love in Ephesians, and that seems to be what it's saying in this first verse. Here's what, what uh, commentary, in the REV commentary, it states, thus a clear way to present what Paul seems to be saying is that we are to be in connection with love or by love, holy and without blemish in God's sight. So, Indeed, one cannot be genuinely holy without being loving. It's connected right to the core and the foundation of being holy and without blame before him in love. Okay, so that's in our opener of, of uh, the purpose of God, plan and purpose of God. Last week, I think what was covered was the prayer. So how does the prayer in chapter 1? So in chapter 1, uh, verse 15 is the opening of the prayer, and, the, and it begins with, because of this, after hearing of your trust in the Lord and the love that you have for all the holy ones, do not stop giving thanks for you, remembering you, remembering you in my prayers. So what Paul brings up here, what God brings up by way of Paul, is that First of all, their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ was heard, but secondly, it was the love that they have for all the holy ones. This is, this is the regard, the affection, the interest in the well-being of. It's, it's the, the roots and the foundation and the connection of love. So in the whole first section, chapter one, we've talked about that being basically a section about Christ being the head of the body we see that it's intimately connected with love and that this love has a lot to do with love one for another and affection for one another. Make sense? 
So far, so good? Okay. So let's then look at chapter two. Chapter two, we're going to see as we get into it uh, in the next few weeks in February, chapter two and three is all about this, if, if Christ is the head, and that's God's plan, then if he's the head of the body, then God's plan is also the body. And so chapter two and three are actually about the church, which is the body of Christ. So God's plan is that Christ would be the head, but he would be the head of a body, the church. And the opener in chapter two, the first 10 verses really deal with how we get into the body of Christ. It's how we get into the family. It's the plan of salvation. And right smack in the middle of it is this gold verse here, uh, verse four. So chapter two and in verse four, it's talking about how we started out dead due to our transgressions and sins. Verse four says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead to our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come he could show the immeasurable riches of his grace by his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We heard in Manifestations tonight, we heard about God's great love for us. If we think about this, if we think of, again, and it's not just love, it's his great love wherewith he loved us. So God having a, um, uh, uh, an attitude of appreciation resulting from conscious evaluation and choice, because of what God did, God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. And because of what he did in Christ Jesus, his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, he saved us, raised us, and seated us so that in the ages to come, all that he's promised, all the scriptures, all the millennial kingdom, all the being with the family, all the forever, we would get to be a part of that because of his great love for us. Love being the highest Christian virtue. Love being the high level of interest in the well-being of another. Can we say that God has a great interest and affection for the well-being and the love of his people, which is us? His great love wherewith he loved us. So rooted in this whole experience, Ephesians experience, is just knowing God. God's deep, um, burning love, his, his, by his own will, by his own action, because of his warm regard and his love for you, his love for his people, his love for his church, which is a great love where with he loved us, he actually saved us, and we're going to be together for all eternity. That's, that's a wonderful love. That's a foundation here in Ephesians around the body. Okay. So, if that's the case, and that's really the rest of chapter 2 and 3 deal with the body of Christ and all about that with the sacred secret, if we go to chapter 3 in the very end of chapter 3 is the prayer of, for the body of Christ. It's the prayer about the body now that it's been expounded in chapter 2 and 3. And so we get to the prayer in chapter 3, and this is where we see the next love come up. And Look at this one, because this is fascinating. In, in verse, um, where should we, I think, let's start in verse 16. We know this is the prayer. He's bowing his knees to the Father. Chapter 3, verse 16 says that according to the riches of his glory, he would grant you to be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, so that Christ would dwell in your hearts through trust, and that you being rooted and grounded in love are fully able to comprehend with all the holy ones what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you are filled with all the fullness of God. So here's the prayer. He's doing the prayer. He begins with, 
His prayer is that we would be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man. Remember, he's talking about the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We're part of the body. The prayer that we would be strengthened with power by his spirit so that, verse 17, Christ would dwell in, dwell in your hearts by faith. Christ is in you when you're saved, right? When, when you're saved, it's Christ in you. But that doesn't necessarily mean Christ is dwelling there in your heart unless you unless you put him there in your heart his prayer is that so he didn't have to pray for your salvation because he's speaking to people that are already saved the prayer is that christ would dwell in your hearts that we would learn to trust him we would learn to trust christ how do we learn to trust him because we trust and rely on him and then we see that he that he comes through that he helps us that he's there for us and therefore, we trust him more, and we grow in relationship with him. And then it says, and that you, having been rooted and grounded in love. This is beautiful. We are, we, the prayer is that we would be rooted in love, and that we would be grounded in love. So rooted is, is all about soil. I see Dave, Dave Hutchings is now on the line. So Dave... Dave could tell us about what it means to root and to plant something, uh, because that's what Dave's got master's and graduate work in plant science, right? And other things like that. And this is, this is being rooted in love. So, um, so, so what is it saying? Love is the soil in which believers are to be rooted and grow. Isn't that neat? That our, our root, we are the soil. The soil for growth is love. It's, it is this high esteem and high regard. And again, where, well, so it's, it's in love, having, having, being rooted and grounded. So, so, um, so first of all, well, so, so being rooted and grounded in God's love, in God's love for us, also in love for others. Again, where do we learn? We're going to see where we learn a lot of this love as we learn it from each other. We learn it when we're, when we're in fellowship and in relationship one with another. That's where often we see how this works. So, so let me read. Here's some, here's some commentary around this is that this idea of being rooted is, is that of being given a source of life-sustaining nourishment and strength, like a tree that buries its roots deep into the earth to draw, to draw necessary nutrients and to provide it with support to remain upright during storms and wind. Believers have their source of life-giving nutrients and strength in love. That's what his prayer would be for us. So the other side, grounded, deals with um, the the base word in Greek deals with providing a foundation. So it's having a it's a foundation like the um, where it talks about um, the wise person who did not fall because it was founded on the rock. That's what that it's it's foundation like that. So so here Paul is using uh, horticulture and architectural imagery to talk about being, for, being planted and established upon a foundation in love. Isn't that beautiful? That's his prayer. That's the prayer. That's how we are to be built. So, and by the way, this, this in love, the, the question is, is it, um, you know, it's, so here are the, is the love referring to, um, is it God's love for the believer? In other words, are we to be rooted and grounded in God's love for the believer? Or is this talking about being rooted in the believer's love for God, Christ, and fellow believers? And we could stop on that. We could talk on that a while. And, and actually, um, all of these things are mentioned in the scriptures. So I think this is one of those John's favorite amphibola, bologna or whatever I call it, amphibologna, whatever it is. It's bologna, but it's, it's both. It can be used both 
ways actually all of those aspects. So what? So this is why I want us to to grow in our concept around love tonight and agape is that it's so the believer, our love for God, our love for Christ, but also our love for each other. This is really what this is what's up in Ephesians, and and it's going to keep coming up for us. Anyway, that would be the prayer. And the second part of that prayer in chapter 3 is that, that we would be so rooted that we would have that soil going so deep, that we would be, we have that strength there, that we would be to the place where we would fully comprehend, back in chapter 3, verse 18, with all the holy ones, what's the breadth and length and height and depth. And by the way, we'll come back and study all this in a big way. This is this will all be fun when we get there. But verse 19 says, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So we, so we are, the prayer is that we would be so rooted and grounded that we would know his love, the love of Christ. And by the way, that his love is, is surpasses knowledge. That word know is that gnosko word that we've talked about? So it's it's to experientially know. So what what's what's up here is that is that it's not head knowledge about Christ and loving Christ. It's experientially knowing the love of Christ. We know it because we've experienced it because we trust in him and we see him and we see his love and what he's done for us. And again, we see it expressed by him and feel it deeply, but also because of the love we can all, I bet, think to times where it was the love someone else expressed by a, by a believer at the right time, at the right place, where we, we, we grasped the unconditional love of God because we experienced it with the love of another. And, and this is what, and yet, as much as we get to experientially know the love of Christ, it'll always be bigger than what we experience, which is why he says, no matter, he wants to, the prayer is that we would know the love of Christ, but that love of Christ will always surpass the knowledge that we have. In other words, in other words there's, there's more to experience in a deep relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no matter how long we walk and how deep that gets, that unless he comes back before, you know, before we take our last breath, we can always grow in our, in our, in our experiential knowing of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And many of those come, don't they, in the deepest times when we need him the most. And that's when he shows up in the storms of life when we need him the most. If I'd thought about it, I'd have brought that pair, that uh, thing about the, the footprints in the sand, because I think that's what relates here in terms of, you know, the, the footprints of where were you, Lord? There was only one footprint. And hey, pal, those were my prints, not yours. And that's what this is really all about. And sometimes those are the times where we fully, fully, or more fully experience the love of Christ that he has for us. Make sense? So that's the prayer. That's okay. So that's the first three chapters. That's in the what has God done for us section regarding love. So let's take a look if he does that. The second half of Ephesians, as we've been talking about, we'll get there, you know, in the months to come, is all about the, the conduct of the believer, the believer's walk. It's walking worthy of our calling. So let's see what, what's up for that in love. Oh, wow. Look at chapter four, the starting point, the opener of, basically, if we look, chapter four begins, what would you, God, what would you like us to do with what you've done for us? So the opener is this, in chapter four, and we'll look, uh, we'll just start in verse one, and it says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called with all humility and meekness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. There's our word. There's our first uh, in chapter four. So the first thing he'd like us to do after praying about 
you know, experientially knowing Christ, depth, height thing, the whole thing that we would really get this greater than ever. He says, you know, walking worthy, let's start walking worthy with humility, meekness, patience, and a great big dose of bearing with one another in love. Isn't that neat? It's the starting point. It's how we start the walk together. It's how we stay walking together. So bearing up with one another in love. Does anybody remember, uh, can anybody remember, um, well, first of all, so here would be a Bible question. What chapter in John, Jesus talks about a new commandment. So the simpler question, what's the new commandment that Jesus talks about in the Gospel of John? Love one well, another as I've loved you. Amen. Exactly. All right, so for 200, what chapter in John is that? 13. Yeah. And somebody said it. Who said it? 13. 13. 13. Mina gets the 200. For 300, what verse is that that he taught within a, within a verse or two? 35. Verse 34. Who? Who got, <laughs> who got 34? Oh, uh, Hutch, of course. We got a ringer in here. We got a ringer. Hutch knows the Bible. So, okay. Yeah. So remember, Jesus talked about this with his disciples a bit. And by the way, there's some great commentary in that verse you could go back to sometime. But the whole thing was about that there would be a new commandment that you would love, you know, love as I have loved you. So here he is right in here in the, in the walking worthy, in unity and maturity, um, is, is this bearing with one another in love. By the way, if we haven't talked about the words, I think we have in Ephesians, one another, but when we read the words one another in Ephesians, anybody remember what, we're, what that's referring to? And maybe we haven't talked about it, but if we have, does anybody remember who's the one another talking about? It's the about body it? of Christ, right? The family? Amen. It's the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. It's talking very specifically, one another, one another. Okay, great. So that's the opener of unity and maturity. Let's look at the, the close of this little section on unity and maturity. The last two verses are verse 15 and 16 of chapter 4 of this great section we'll get to in a couple of months. So verse 15 says, so remember we've, it's been bearing, bearing one another in love, Verse 15 says, but speaking the truth in love. Remember we talked about experiencing Ephesians in love. This is the phrase. This is, it comes up all over. We are speaking the truth. So truth is important. Speaking is important. But the rooting and grounding of it that is round, it's grounded in, in love. And it says, that's the way we grow. Remember, we did. he just prayed that we would be rooted and we would grow. We would grow because our roots, our soil is love. Here, when we're speaking the truth in love, that's how we grow up in every way into him who is the head, Christ. The prayer is that we would do it. Now he's saying again that we do it in love. And then verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by every supporting ligament with each individual part doing its proper function produces the growth of the body with the goal of building itself up in love. That's the message. So chapter, again, this section's all about how we grow. It's unity and maturity in the body of Christ, love. Starts it, ends it with this section. Now, I will pause primarily for David's sake, just to make sure, because I know you guys speak in when you want, but I will pause for a moment just to ask anybody any thoughts, any questions, any discussion point there before we go to our next piece of love. I have a question. Yes, Dave. Um you refer to uh, John three three sixteen, where it says, and "So God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever." I just wondering, what does the world mean to you there? You know, because it's not the planet 
earth, I don't think. But um, what, what, what is your take when it says the world, God so loved the world? Yeah, I, mine would be, I think what yours would be also, it's the people of the world. He so loved the people. He so loved the people that inhabit the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. I mean, that would, that would be my sense. Any, any additional? So they like the inhabited world. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And, and probably, again, if John were on, he'd tell us that's what that word meant, you know, or whatever. I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. But okay. yeah, Dave, that would be my sense. It's the inhabited world, the people of the world. Um, although, I would say, uh, just thinking out loud, I would add that, that remember that Christ died not just for people. I mean, we like to think of it because it's pretty important to us that he died for people. But actually, the whole creation does groan and prevail in uh, whatever that talks about in Romans, that there's a fallen world, there's fallen people. Actually, the fallen, the, I mean, cosmos. The, angels, the, whole cosmos. the whole cosmos, all of this is hinged on the Messiah coming to redeem all of the above. So, um, you know, so I, although I do think it is people, I like to think that whosoever will is talking about people. I think in a broader scheme, the entire world, the entire creation is waiting for the Messiah because he will set all things straight. Right on. <laughs> Any other? So, um, so in order to ground it and root it and ground it in love, we believers have to comprehend how God loved us. And that is John 3.16 and sums up, you know, and he basically sacrificed his son's life for, for us. Amen. Um, so understanding that and start loving, loving, you know, that accepted that by God, you know, I, I believe that myself, you know, like first John says, we didn't love God, but God first loved us. So then, then once I said that, really that become reality in my life. And then I can really manifest the love of God in my fellow believers. And we can do that each other. Then we can see manifested love of God. A beautiful. Amen. And, and, um, and that that would then be the nature born within us that we would, we would have his nature. You know, so often if, if you have, um, if, you know, the, and people have different families. I mean, if, if someone had a family where they, they felt their parents or their mother or their father had unconditional love for them, then that's a wonderful, then they, they can experience and go, well, if my earthly family had that much love, how much greater my heavenly father? And for others who maybe didn't, have that, then it's understanding that our Heavenly Father, that we can and build in and have a nature to, to again, to experience unconditional love of our Heavenly Father, of our Lord. And again, often where we, where we learn that, I would suggest, and this is what I think we're going to see in Ephesians, we learn that by, because we see it in one another. When believers when we walk in love one for another. And the impact of that, I think, goes so far more than we know um, when we endeavor to walk with our Father's, Heavenly Father's nature. Mina, your love pillow is upside down. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, so, all, so we've seen love in chapter one. We saw with, uh, we've seen in chapter two. We see it in chapter three. We saw in chapter four, actually the most uses of love, chapter five. Where do you think the greatest section, the greatest many times it's used is? This is a, it's called uh, husband and wife relationships. So we're going to get there, but we'll get a warm up to it. Because chapter five, so if we go to chapter five, verse one, and this is, this, Mina, I think 
speaks directly to what you were saying because chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So if we, if we, if we can grasp and pray for, this is, this, is, this is prayer for the believers that we would, just like praying for wisdom and revelation that John shared last week and things like that, it's praying for, for the, that we can comprehend the love of God, the love of Christ, and therefore to be imitators as beloved children, as children imitate their parents. We would imitate our Father's love, what that looks like, what that feels like, and express that to others to the best of our ability. And verse 2 says, and walk in love. This is, again, in connection with love, in relationship with love, by love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling fragrance. Isn't that neat? This is on the practical side, again, the example side, what we're to, to consider, to endeavor. This is like a, this is sort of a meaty couple of verses here, don't you think? It's, we're to be imitators of God as beloved children. So first knowing, I think this is Mina, your heart, is we need to really know we are beloved children to God. We are his beloved children. We need to remember and know and feel, or whether we feel or not, we are his beloved, beloved children. His great love wherewith he loved us. If he loved us when we were dead due to trespasses and sins, how much, how much love does he have for, I mean, those of you on this call, you're, you want to live a life to his glory. You want to love him. You stand for him. You All of those things. It, to know that you are a beloved child and to be an imitator of that heavenly father as a beloved child. And then here he says it. So the, so the encouragement is walk in love, walk, you know, walking is our behavior. It's what we do. So it's to walk in love and the standard set or a standard, a measure. In one sense, if you're in a family, it's the goody two-shoes brother, you know, where I, which I certainly wasn't, I didn't fit. And here's, hey, look at your brother, Jesus. Look what he does. He, he loves so much, he gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling fragrance. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know? So there, I'm just, obviously, I'm just being facetious that here's our example. This is our brother. We have the love of God. But what did our brother do? He loved enough. He gave himself up for us. That's our, he's, he's the model. He's our, our living model that we can see and experience when we read the Gospels and experience him and all of those things. And, and we certainly see here that love is in giving. John 3.16 that, that Dave was quoting, God so loved that he gave, Jesus so loved that he gave. And the giving of himself up was as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling fragrance. So this is, okay, now is this, is this little couple verses, is this just written to husbands, or is this written to everyone? For everyone. So that's fair, right? We all, I mean, in one sense, he's just laid out the standard for all of us, is that we are all to walk in love just as Jesus Christ loved us, and he gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice. Okay, with that in mind, and I think, <laughs> ladies, you gotta love this, that he would know what knuckleheads, and so it's like, hey, by the way, if you didn't get it because you weren't paying attention, because you were watching TV and watching the Super Bowl, let me kind of spell it out straight. Hey, husbands, yeah. Love your wives. So there's, if again, if it wasn't quite clear, if it wasn't quite straightforward, if it wasn't enough that we're supposed to do that, this is really, and again, this is, here's Ephesians, the greatness of the purpose of the ages, the plan of all that. And we're going to get into that. We're going to spend a bunch of time in this section, which is going to be a lot of fun. But I love that here, what the 
kind of this culmination of love in Ephesians, what he would bring up would be this, this, this intimate relationship that says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's what he just said in verse 1 and 2, isn't it? He's making the connection again. Here's the standard. So, so look at this. Here he's, and he, and he, even though we made it up in verse 1, we're coming right back to it. This whole section, listen to, this is a section about how Christ loved. So it says, and, and not, let me restate that. It's not just how Christ loved sort of generically. It's how he loved the church. Who's the church? We are the church. How he loved us. This is how Christ loved us. He says, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So in this, we've got in this case, a bride and a groom. Who's the groom? Jesus. The church is the bride. Okay. So just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he, Christ, could make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he could present the church, us, the body. He could present the church to himself as a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, she who, the church, the body of Christ in this case, that she would be holy and without blemish. Where did we read about being holy and without blemish in Ephesians? Ephesians 1. Jean, exactly. Jean got it in sign language. Uh, Jan, Janet got it in sign language. I'm reading Jean's thing. Janet got in sign language first, which is... Um, that to be holy without blemish, we started Ephesians that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish in his presence in love. Here, we're now saying Jesus gave himself so that he could present to who? God. In his pre he could present, to, well, to present to himself and, and to God a glorious church that the church would be holy and without blemish. So there's the standard. Verse 28, in the same way. Wow. In the same way, husbands are obligated to love their own wives as their own bodies. This is the, you want to talk about the greatness of experiencing Ephesians in love? I mean, this, this is kind of, you know, God's kind of saying, you want to see it? See it in the relationship with the people that are the most intimate relationships with you. That's where we live, Ephesians. That's we, so anyway, so here is, so husbands are obligated, <laughs> under obligation to love their own wives as their own bodies. Um, he who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. Again, I kind of feel like, ladies, it's pretty, God kind of knows, okay, for men, uh, let's see what we could come up with. How are you to love where you're going to get it and understand what that means? Well, how about loving as you love yourself? Because no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and tenderly cares for it. In other words, takes care of, hey, if I'm hungry, going to eat, you know, clean, all those things. Well, if that's the case, and the, and the imagery is, well, then as you would do that to take care of, his, take care of your wife is part of the one. It's, it is the body as he loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh nourishes and tenderly cares for it just as Christ does for the church because we are members of his body gives the example you know the 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 uh, back to Genesis for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife 
and the two will become one flesh. The sacred secret is great, but I speak in regard to Christ and the church. So this, this example of living in love in Ephesians is the example and the encouragement to husbands. And verse 33 says, in any case, you know, for all this stuff that we're talking about, in any case, each of you also is to love his own wife as he loves himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Kind of neat that that's in Ephesians, don't you think? So anyway, I think we'll have a lot of fun when we get there. Lots to talk about, I'm sure, when we get there in a few months. Before I go to chapter 6, let, let's pause uh, just for any, any comment, any thought, any question around the chapter 5. Yeah, no, just a little thing. I like the way at the end of 4, it says, be kind to one another tended harder, forgiving each other, and then five opens up, therefore, be imitators of God, who's the great forgiver. <laughs> I, amen. If, if there was something God wanted us to know about the purpose of the ages, it would have to be this learning to live in love, one with another, in all the relationships. So it's really, really something. So... So we, let me ask one question here. The, the, this phrase "in love," like in verse two, "walk in love," and in earlier we had "in His presence in love." And we say "rooted and grounded in love." So, does it, could you elaborate on that a little bit? It's like it doesn't say "walk with a loving attitude." You know, it's it says like you're ba you're bathing yourself and you're you're bathed in love or you're I don't know. What, how do you, how can you expand on that? Great, great question, Doug. And my, my best understanding, and there may be more, but is that the in love would be similar to the one other phrase, by the way, that would be used in Ephesians. I said, I think love is used the most. Somebody will have to tell me. But the one other phrase that's used a lot is the in him phrase we've been talking about in chapter one. And in that, and that in him is, it's in relationship with him, in connection with him. So it's, it's deeper. And the best that I can see this in love would be the same thing, walking. So it would be like, um, uh, be imitators of God and walking, walking by love, walking in connection with love, walking in relationship with love, you know, whether it's in relationship with love for our Heavenly Father, love for our Lord and Savior, love with one another. So my, my sense is it's that, it's that connection, that living by love, living in connection with love, living in relationship to love in these things we do, like we are in relationship with Jesus Christ in the in Him. That's, that's the best that I see. Uh, there may be uh, Jeff, this is Virgil. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, can Go. you hear me? Yes, I can. Go for okay. it. Okay. You know, like in verse 25, that's uh, hope, uh, hopefully I'm right. I, I know several of the couples on this line, and I'm sure they feel the same way that I do as far as husbands love your wife. Uh, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, uh, Christ died for the church. You know, died for us, and I'm sure that every husband and wife that I know on this hook up tonight, you know, Doug and Carol, and Dave and and the Tysons, uh, they would we would die for one another, you know, because of our love for Christ and for the church, and the wife being a part of that church is even I mean to me is really important. Then I think that's the ultimate love, the ultimate sacrifice is death. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Beautiful. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Just yes. a uh, cursory count, the, a combination of in him, in whom, and in Christ appears 25 times in Ephesians. Ooh. There'd only be in love by one. There you go. By one. By one. There you go. So, uh, so, so Doug, I don't, I don't know if that helps, but that I think that in him, 
I think in there is that relationship, the connection, the, the, it's the broader term about it, if that helps. Okay. Um, hey, the, the other side and, and the other side of what you just shared, which I, I, I'm pointing down you, sir, um, that I just love with that is, is you know, and in, in I, I would say, um, I don't know if I speak for all husbands, but I would say where I have learned the unconditional love of God is I've learned that in the greatest with my wife, with Pam, that that's where the deeply, deeply intimate, unconditional love, I've learned that um, with my wife. And it's interesting, I, my sense, I could be wrong, we'll get into all this when we get there, is, you know, God didn't necessarily have to tell the wives to do the same thing, because I think they get it innately or easily. I think he had to drill it because it's the husbands that got to figure this thing out and learn that sacrificial love that you've spoken to, that we would do that. And so um, I think it may be that God has to kind of pound that in too uh, on our side. I don't know, just saying. Uh, that's, because, we'll when we get that's, there. Because, that's because women know how to have to give themselves totally to give birth to a new human being. Amen. I'm totally, totally. This section, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm so excited to when we actually get to some of these sections like this. This is going to be plain fun and having couples on, like you mentioned, just having a couple. I think this is, this is just going to be a fun one to talk about. So for time's sake, I'm going to move on to the last because I want us to recognize that this, this entire letter, this great letter of Ephesians, we get to the very end. And how does, how does Ephesians end? Well, it ends in love but it's even one word a little bit bigger. So look at this. We look at the last two verses. Chapter 6, verse 23 says, Peace to uh, the brothers and sisters, and love with trust from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last verse, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love incorruptible, unending, undying, never ending. It's who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a never ending, incorruptible love. That's, that's the anchor and the ending of the book of Ephesians. So I think clearly experiencing Ephesians, we cannot experience Ephesians unless we ex are experiencing Ephesians in love. And I'd like to, um, encourage you, I have a homework assignment for next week. Given that we're not going to be together next week, I thought next week, so I want you to do, so here's, here's two things. One is every heart you see between now and Valentine's Day, when you see a heart, when you give a heart, when you look at a heart, anything's got a heart on it, I want you to think what Mina said, I want you to think that represents the love of God to you. That is God's heart of love as a beloved child. That is his heart of love for you. So that would be, that would be something to think about. But my, the homework would be the next Thursday uh, on Valentine's that you would find someone, hopefully if you're married, it would be your spouse or someone like that, but it might be your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your relative. Another believer, it would be someone that I would say you would love the one or the ones that you're with. And that for the Valentine's Day, for the one day to work, to endeavor to have unconditional love, that unconditional love for that one day, just for that day, to try and love unconditionally uh, with that love for the one day. And, and a hint would be... <laughs> you might want to practice that living in love each day up to Valentine's Day because you know how it'd be like, go out and you say, I want you to run five miles next week and if you haven't done it. So the, the, why not go out and run for 30 minutes or walk for 30 minutes tomorrow and kind of build up to it? So my encouragement would be, hey, build up to it. 
build up each day next week. Try to do some things. Have an increasing amount of that love. And then on Valentine's Day, do your best to hit it. And when it screws up, say you're sorry and go right back at it. Try to get there for the entire day as much as you can. That would be my homework. And what I'd love to do when we get back together in two weeks, if David, David will have all of his heart sharing time, would be to share. I'd love to share anybody's story, their Valentine's story of experiencing Ephesians in love over the next couple of weeks, okay?